The Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics helps us to see what it means to approach the process of interpretation with the conviction that the Bible is the inerrant, the error-free Word of God. And here in part two, we're going to look at some more of the articles of that Chicago Statement. The Bible contains various kinds of literature. We affirm that awareness of the literary categories, formal and stylistic, of the various parts of Scripture is essential for proper exegesis, and hence we value genre criticism as one of the many disciplines of biblical study. Well, that's kind of a mouthful with some difficult phrases, so let's look at that a little more carefully. The Bible contains different kinds of literary categories. Sometimes a parable will be told. There might be a poem here. And to understand a poem as though it's a very straightforward historical statement is a big mistake. To understand a parable in that manner would be a big mistake. To take a vision with lots of symbols in it as straightforward uh, history would be a big mistake. So there's a variety of literary categories, and we call those different types of literature genres. Uh, the word genre is just another word for a type of literature. And genre criticism is not the process of, boy, I'm really critical about genres. I'm really grumpy about those genres, and I'm going to say bad things about them. Genre criticism is a very careful analysis of the literary types of different kinds of writing in the Bible. And so genre criticism is a valuable thing so that you don't misunderstand certain things in the Bible. I'll take a historical example. A man named Origen was one of the great thinkers in the period of the early Christians. He lived about 200 years after Jesus, and Origen sometimes had difficulty understanding genres. He would read straightforward history and find all kinds of hidden allegorical meanings. But he took a phrase of Jesus where Jesus spoke of being eunuchs for the kingdom of God and castrated himself. Now that's a very strong example of the difficulty of not having your genre understood properly. And genre criticism, the process of finding out what type of literature we're talking about here, is this a parable? Is it exaggeration for the sake of effect, also known as hyperbole? Um, if so, then we shouldn't take it in just a straightforward, go do this sort of manner as Origen did when it came to castrating himself. Or Jesus' words, pluck out your eye and throw it away. Does Jesus want you to just rip out your eye and cut off your hand anytime you face a temptation? No, you need to understand that that's a genre, a way of communication of exaggerated effect. And so genre criticism is the kind of study that helps us to grasp that sort of thing. Now, in light of all that, nonetheless, we deny that generic categories which negate historicity may rightly be imposed on biblical narratives which present themselves as factual. So there are different kinds of biblical literature, including parable and figurative speech, even a few allegories and so on. But we can't take those categories and use those to wipe out the historical nature of the history in the Bible. That's what the denial is saying. There's a kind of misuse of genre criticism, which says, well, you know, we kind of think that um, Genesis just doesn't make much sense to us anymore in light of new discoveries that we have. And even though it presents itself as history, we know that it really had to be kind of a parable or just a, a folk tale. No. If the Bible presents stories as history, then they are to be taken as factual. Biblical narratives are telling true stories. Biblical parables or poetry might be using figures of speech, and you need to understand them as such, but don't claim that any historical narrative that makes you a little uncomfortable must have been just a parable or a poem. We affirm that the biblical record of events, discourses, and sayings, though presented in a variety of appropriate literary forms, corresponds to historical fact. And we deny that any event, discourse, or saying reported in Scripture was invented by the biblical writers or by the traditions they incorporated. 
Sometimes people will say, Jesus didn't actually say some of these things, but the later authors, seeing some of the needs in the church of their time, just made up sayings and put them in Jesus' mouth. Or they told a story about a miracle that Jesus didn't actually do, but that miracle kind of came in handy to make a point that the later author wanted to convey. No. When Scripture presents something as a matter that was said or done, then it was said and it was done. And it corresponds to historical fact. We affirm the necessity of interpreting the Bible according to its literal or normal sense. Now, we've got to be very careful about that word literal. Because nowadays we take the word literal mostly to mean that it's just a direct statement of fact. Well, that's not what literal means quite in this context. It means rather the normal sense of understanding what the author is saying. So if the author is telling a parable, you take it as parable and that's the literal way to understand it. If the author is using a figure of speech, you take it as a figure of speech and that's the literal way of understanding what he was trying to convey. So we affirm the necessity of interpreting the Bible according to its literal or normal sense. And the literal sense is the grammatical historical sense. That is the meaning which the writer expressed. So to be literal is to take the writer as he intended his words to be taken. That, in, that involves listening careful, carefully to his grammar and to the historical setting in which he was conveying his message and therefore we take him literally when we're understanding what he's trying to say, not when we assume that every vision with a dragon in it means that there are really dragons flying all over the place. Interpretation, according to the literal sense, will take account of all figures of speech and literary forms found in the text. We deny the legitimacy of any approach to Scripture that attributes to it meaning which the literal sense does not support. And so, when you have a straightforward biblical narrative, be careful about putting all kinds of allegorical meanings onto it. Take an, in, an example. When David goes out to fight Goliath and picks up five smooth stones, it really means the five books of Moses with which we go out with truth to smite the enemies of truth. No, it doesn't. It means he picked up five rocks so that he had some spare ammo if the first one missed. He picked up five rocks and he fired one of them at Goliath and killed him. And it is not the meaning of that biblical text that the five books of Moses are somehow contained in those five stones. We deny the legitimacy of any approach to Scripture that attributes to it meaning which the literal sense does not support. You understand now what's meant by literal. It doesn't mean that every figurative idea needs to be taken literally in the way that we sometimes mean literally. It means taking the normal sense and trying to understand what the writer was expressing. And once we grasp what the writer is expressing, we don't try to invent all kinds of other hidden meanings that might be contained there. We affirm that legitimate critical techniques should be used in determining the canonical text and its meaning. There is a whole discipline of study called textual criticism. And again, it's not saying bad things about the text or being critical in that sense. Textual criticism is trying to determine from the many, many manuscripts of the scripture that we have from ancient times what the most accurate text is. And another kind of criticism is involved in just careful study of the text and of its meaning. And so, we affirm that there is a legitimate place for the techniques that you use, those careful analytical techniques, that's what's meant by the word critical, careful and analytical, and that they should be used in trying to figure out the best text from the original manuscripts and the most accurate meaning. But we deny the legitimacy of allowing any method of biblical criticism to question the truth or integrity of the writer's expressed meaning or of any other scriptural teaching. There's a distinction here between what is sometimes called lower criticism and higher criticism. Lower criticism is good um, in this case, and higher criticism is bad. Higher criticism is the kind of critic that raises himself above the biblical text, and after he's determined what the original manuscripts were and what the original writer's meaning is, then decides whether he finds that meaning 
to be true or acceptable or not. Well, that's not a valid kind of way to approach the Bible. We do not sit above the Bible in higher criticism. Lower criticism is a humble effort to grasp what the original text is and then what it means, but having grasped that, then to accept it, to believe what it teaches, to obey what it commands. And so there are legitimate techniques to understand but it is illegitimate to use any technique which calls into question whether the writers knew what they were talking about, whether what they said ought to be believed. Scripture interprets Scripture. We affirm the unity, harmony, and consistency of Scripture and declare that it is its own best interpreter. We deny that Scripture may be interpreted in such a way as to suggest that one passage corrects or militates against another one. There is no clash of one part of Scripture with another. We deny that later writers of Scripture misinterpreted earlier passages of Scripture when quoting from or referring to them. Sometimes the higher critics accuse New Testament authors of distorting or misquoting or twisting the meaning of Old Testament passages that they quoted. Well, we believe that the Bible is a unity in the revelation of God, that its truths are harmonious and consistent, and when we can't figure out how two passages fit together, we study them a little longer to see whether we misunderstood one passage, whether we misunderstood the other one, or if there's a way of harmonizing them that we didn't previously realize. But we don't say, the one is right, the other is wrong. The right one is straightening out the wrong one. We deny that one passage just goes against another or that later writers are mistaken in the way they're handling earlier passages. And a very important part of this then is when you're studying the Bible, one of the most important principles in hermeneutics is the best commentary on any one passage of the Bible is the other passages in the Bible. Before you go to this scholar or that expert commentary, read what the rest of the Bible has to say on the matter that you're trying to understand in a particular passage. Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. We affirm that the Bible's own interpretation of itself is always correct, never deviating from, but rather elucidating, leading out the single meaning of the inspired text. The single meaning of a prophet's words includes, but is not restricted to, the understanding of those words by the prophet and necessarily involves the intention of God evidenced in the fulfillment of those words. We deny that the writers of Scripture always understood the full implications of their own words. What's being said here is that the text has a single meaning, but sometimes there may have been more to that meaning than the human author fully understood. God himself fully understood the meaning. Let's take an example. When David wrote Psalm 22 and wrote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they have pierced my hands and my feet, and they've gambled over my clothing, and so on. Did he know exactly what was going to happen in the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Possibly not. We don't know how much David understood about what was to come when he wrote that psalm, but God knew what was to come, and New Testament authors who draw upon that psalm and see it fulfilled in Jesus are right to do so. We don't have to say that David understood everything that was to come. Abraham was promised that through his offspring all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. Did he know the name of that coming offspring would be Jesus? Did he know exactly how Jesus was going to bring those blessings and atone for sins? No, probably not. But in the things revealed to Abraham, God knew what he was revealing, and the words that were written accurately expressed what was to come, though not fully. And the full meaning would come out as God further revealed himself in the events of Jesus' life and in the writings of the New Testament. The point, though, is that in the Bible's interpretation of things, it's bringing out the fuller meaning of the older texts of the scriptures, and God is revealing what he had in mind, even if what he had in mind wasn't fully grasped by the prophet who wrote it down. 
We affirm that any pre-understandings which the interpreter brings to Scripture should be in harmony with scriptural teaching and subject to correction by it. So when you come to scripture, you have all kinds of things that you take to be true, assumptions that you have, ways of looking at the world, your worldview. But when you come to it, those things need to be in harmony with scriptural teaching, and where they're not, you need to be willing to have that corrected by scripture as you come to fuller understanding. And therefore, we deny that scripture should be required to fit alien pre-understandings inconsistent with itself. Here are some examples. Naturalism, evolutionism, scientism, secular humanism, relativism. Naturalism is basically the idea that miracles don't happen, that God does not intervene in his world, perhaps even that God does not exist. But there are some theologians who grant that maybe a God exists, but everything in the Bible that sounds miraculous can't be true, and the kernel of meaning is more likely to be something about moral behavior and relating to a transcendent God. But that's letting naturalism rule out what obviously is revealed in the Bible as miraculous. Evolutionism, the idea that something came from nothing, that lower forms of life produce higher forms of life, that life came from dead matter, that intelligence came from non-intelligent forms of life, all that kind of stuff is not in keeping with the Bible. It does not happen on its own. God created. Um, scientism, that's not meaning science itself, but scientism, which makes science the measure of all truth and the source of all truth, secular humanism, which makes man the center of all things. There, there are many of these things which shape the way we tend to think, and even if we don't embrace those as the philosophy we're committed to, we need to be aware of the degree to which they influence the way we think and what we find plausible or acceptable. And we have to be very cautious about those kinds of pre-understandings, which, which are kind of like in the water we drink and in the air we breathe many times, but when we come to Scripture and we find something in Scripture and say, oh, that doesn't make very much sense, we've got to sit back and say, now, does it not make sense because I've misunderstood the Scripture or because I had a lousy pre-understanding or presupposition based on flaws in my worldview? We affirm that since God is the author of all truth, all truths, biblical and extra-biblical or beyond the Bible, are consistent and cohere. And that the Bible speaks truth when it touches on matters pertaining to nature, history, or anything else. We further affirm that in some cases, extra-biblical data have value for clarifying what Scripture teaches and for prompting correction of faulty interpretations. We deny that extra-biblical views ever disprove the teaching of Scripture or hold priority over it. All truth is God's truth. And not all truths are revealed in the Bible. There are many things that are true that the Bible does not state or talk about. And so we say God is the author of all truths, and we should believe truths that are outside the Bible as well as inside it. But we also affirm that the truths that aren't revealed in the Bible do not contradict the truths that are revealed in the Bible. And when the Bible speaks about nature or history or other things, that is true and it is not contradicted by the facts. Now, there are times when discovery of facts outside the Bible has caused people to say, oh, maybe the Bible didn't mean what we thought it meant after all. When the Bible speaks of the four corners of the earth, some people might have thought that meant that the earth was square. Or when the Bible said, the earth is established, it cannot be moved. Some took that to mean the earth had to be the fixed point as the center of the universe, and it turned out not to be so. Now, is that because the Bible was wrong? No. That statement about the earth is established, it cannot be moved, comes in the context of a poem, not in a straightforward discourse on the scientific location of the earth. So there are times when truths from outside the Bible cause us to look again at how we understood a particular statement in the Bible and say, nah, it didn't mean that after all. But that doesn't mean that we can take things that don't seem to fit the Bible and say, well, then the Bible's wrong. We may have to examine our understanding, but there may be times when we have to change our understanding of the Bible 
There may also be times when we say, hey, our, our understanding of the Bible on that point is correct, and it is the other claim to truth coming from outside the Bible that is wrong. We affirm the harmony of special with general revelation. Special revelation is when God speaks through Scripture and through His special acts in Christ and through His prophets. General revelation is God's showing of something of Himself in the things that He has made in creation. We affirm the harmony of special with general revelation and therefore of biblical teaching with the facts of nature. We deny that any genuine scientific facts are inconsistent with the true meaning of any passage of Scripture. So there may be times when naturalistic, unbelieving science clashes with facts in the Bible, but genuine science, true facts, will not clash with the true meaning of any passage of Scripture. Sometimes scientists are wrong about what the creation is indicating, Sometimes theologians are wrong about what the Bible is indicating, but when the scientists are on target and the theologians are on target, the scientists and the theologians are going to agree. And along with all of that, one of the most challenged portions of the Bible is Genesis, especially Genesis 1 through 11. It's factual. We affirm that Genesis 1 through 11 is factual, as is the rest of the book. We deny that the teachings of Genesis 1 through 11 are mythical, and that scientific hypotheses about earth history or the origin of humanity may be invoked to overthrow what Scripture teaches about creation. Genesis is not just an allegory, it's not just a poem, it's factual. Jesus referred to the flood in Noah's time as a fact. The Apostle Paul referred to Adam as a real person and to Christ as the second Adam. It is very, very hard to deny the teachings of Genesis 1 through 11 and then take serious the teaching of Jesus and of Paul. Genesis is factual and we must take it in that manner. Now, there are different ways of being factual. Let's say, for instance, someone were to ask you, describe the process of human reproduction from the point of conception to the point of birth. And the person asking you that was a biology professor and you were to write that down on your biology exam. What you write down would have a certain format and to do it accurately you would have to describe certain details of anatomy. Now, let's say your child asks you, a, a little child asks, where do babies come from? you will not give exactly the same kind of answer as you give to the biology professor. But nonetheless, you can still give a true answer, a factual answer, and you'll speak of mommy and daddy and their love for each other, and you may use a figure of speech here or there, or you may be a little more straightforward, but you're not going to express it exactly the same way as you would for the science professor. Now, when God speaks to us in Genesis, he's not necessarily answering in the mode that a science professor would ask on an exam. He may be giving us a, a simplified and clear history, occasionally using a figure of speech here or there. But he's giving us history. Back to our illustration, where do babies come from? If you say, the stark brings them, honey, you're just giving a myth. There is a way of expressing history in a simplified form, but it is very different from just making up a story. And Genesis 1 through 11 is not a case of, the stork did it, honey. God did it. God is real. Adam was real. Eve was real. The creation of the world was real. The fall into sin was a real fall. God's judgment and the flood were a real judgment and a real flood. And we are to understand and believe those chapters of Genesis as real history, even if God doesn't go into abundant scientific detail about how he did everything. Genesis is factual. Here's an article about perspicuity. Perspicuity is one of those unusual words which just means clearness. And the perspicuity of Scripture is a long-standing doctrine that Scripture can be understood. We affirm the clarity of Scripture, and specifically, of its message about salvation from sin. 
We deny that all passages of Scripture are equally clear or have equal bearing on the message of redemption. So in believing the clarity of Scripture, we don't insist that everything in the Bible is equally obvious or easy to understand. But we do say that in the matter of human sin and of salvation through Jesus Christ, Scripture is abundantly clear to even the most uneducated reader. And we don't need a whole committee of experts to tell us what it means necessarily. We do, however, know that not every passage of Scripture is equally important, is equally related to the message of redemption, and certainly some are not equally clear. There are some portions, that even as the Apostle Peter said of Paul, that are hard to understand. And the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture or of the perspicuity of Scripture has to take into account the fact that not all things are equally clear. Now, how does this relate to biblical scholarship? We affirm that a person is not dependent for understanding of Scripture on the expertise of biblical scholars. There's a lot you can understand from the Bible without a lot of expert help and advice. Even so, we deny that a person should ignore the fruits of the technical study of Scripture by biblical scholars. Now that's not a contradiction. That is simply um, observing two sides of the truth. The truth is that there are many portions of Scripture and much of the most important aspect of Scripture that you don't need experts to explain to you. You need to simply listen with an open mind with the help of the Holy Spirit and you will be able to grasp much of it. You do not need an official magisterium for all such things as the Catholic Church has claimed and neither do you need a panel of experts from Protestant seminaries who are the only ones who could possibly understand what the Bible means. No, you're not dependent for grasping the Scripture. And this is what the Reformers and others have fought for, the right for people to read the Bible for themselves in their own language and to benefit from the Bible. But one can go to the opposite extreme and say, I and I alone can understand everything that is worth understanding in the Bible and my superior intelligence and the obvious clarity of the Bible on all matters means that I can just ignore all those experts. Who needs them? The fact is, you need them. I need them. Even every Bible dictionary and commentary that you might turn to or every map was prepared by somebody who wasn't you. So even the helps that you might use in understanding the Bible were prepared by someone besides yourself. The translation of the Bible from the Greek and the Hebrew was done by people who were experts in technical study of Scripture, who were scholars. You would not have access to the Bible if that work had not been done by people who understood those original languages. And so we deny that we should just say, oh, who needs them? Devout scholars who are part of the body of Christ are a part of the body that the rest of the body can really benefit from. They shouldn't get their nose in the air. They shouldn't get too high an opinion of themselves and say, oh, nobody can understand anything of the Bible without me. But there are some things where some folks have put in a lot of study with a devout heart and a brilliant mind, and they have a lot to teach us. There are many passages in the Bible that are challenging. And with the help of people who have more learning than we do, we can gain a great deal of understanding in what God is communicating in those passages. So that's a healthy attitude toward Bible scholars, appreciating them, learning from them, but not just deferring to them and say, oh, I could never read the Bible on my own because only experts can grasp anything of it. No, read the Bible on your own. Read it over and over again, and then be willing to listen to others of more knowledge who have also read the Bible and studied it with great care. And finally, the final article is on biblical preaching. We affirm that the only type of preaching which sufficiently conveys the divine revelation and its proper application to life is that which faithfully expounds the text of Scripture as the Word of God. We deny that the preacher has any message from God apart from the text of Scripture. A preacher who gets up and tells his funny little stories and entertains people and is not basing his message on the Word of God has no divine 
authority. Likewise, a preacher who gets up and claims to preach from the Bible but got his interpretation badly wrong is not preaching with divine authority. He's not rightly understanding the word of truth and not rightly handling it. And that means for those of us who are preachers, we have a great calling to try to understand what the text of the Word of God says, to understand it accurately. And then, when we understand it accurately, we know it is the very Word of the living God Himself, and when we get up in the pulpit, we speak with the authority of the living God. And that means we can't just be lazy and short-circuit the process of careful study to determine what the text of Scripture is saying to us. There are many other articles in the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics that we've looked at. Those 25 articles are each quite important for those of us who are preachers. This last one is kind of the upshot. If you're going to preach in the name of God and on the authority of God, you had better anchor everything in the text of the written Word of God.